Colorado shifts its vaccine plan again. Some people move up in line, others back. We talked to the numbers people, tracking just how many Coloradans have ever had COVID. I mean, even mild cases. Excel warned us this week about higher natural gas prices right after the Texas power collapse. What's going on here? And a family that brought us one of the most emotionally beautiful moments of 2020 is back. They have more good news because it's Friday and it's next. It's Friday night, Colorado. Let's do shots. Next up, according to the new schedule from the state today, is everyone age 60 and up, plus grocery store employees and agricultural workers, all of them eligible for the vaccine as of Monday. The state is going to call that phase 1B3, just to confuse people. Democratic Governor Jared Polis announced a newly created phase today, phase 1B4, in late March. That will be for people 50 plus and other essential workers like folks in restaurants and public transit. Now, they had expected to be next. They get pushed back a bit. Now, all the rest of us who are in what we'll call the caboose phase, general population, we could start getting shots before the end of April. That's according to the governor today. That is pretty early compared to the state's previous estimates. It appears to be optimism based on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which should be approved this weekend. If there's a rapid acceleration of doses, yes, could be mid-April at the earliest. If they don't accelerate and sort of stay with modest acceleration, it could be mid-May. So I think in that time frame, mid-April to mid-May, you kind of have the outside bounds of when the general public will have access to the vaccine. Uh, no more phases, no more tiering. Possible uh, criterion based on age. It might simply be 40 and up, and then a few weeks later, 39 and under. Or potentially, if the quantity is there, it might just be everybody who wants it. The state is going to ask providers, not mandate, ask them to continue to prioritize people in the higher risk groups, move them to the head of the line, and that will continue even as we move into the general population vaccinations. Just under 15% of Colorado's population has received one dose of the COVID vaccine, about 856,000 people, and more than half of those folks made their shot a double. 358 Coloradans are currently hospitalized with COVID-19. That is down 16 patients from the day before, down 46 patients from this time last week. It's clear that it's a slowing rate of decline in hospitalizations, but it's dropping nonetheless. Do you want to know how many Coloradans ever had COVID, like even a mild case? Want to know how many Coloradans have it right at this minute? Want to know how many people will get it soon? The state goes to the same team of people for all of those answers. And so did our Anusha Roy. Pretty much since the start of the pandemic, COVID stats are a part of Andrea Bookwall's daily routine. I try not to do it on Fridays generally, but I, I'm rarely rarely successful in that goal. So every day for nearly a year, she's been combing through hospitalization and case data. In academia, I think sometimes we feel like we're yelling into a void. People are definitely listening this time, including decision makers at the State Department of Health. The COVID-19 modeling group made up of a dozen researchers estimates around 24% of the Denver metro region has had COVID at some point in the last year. That's 27% for the state. But overall right now, they're seeing a decline in transmission. You know, one of the big issues with estimating the true number of people who have had COVID is that a lot of people can have completely asymptomatic infections mm. and may never be detected by the surveillance systems in place. So we attempt to account for that. Every week, this team delivers the models to the state that current estimates show one in 194 Coloradans are infectious. They run through different scenarios to forecast health care needs and to see if the health care system could be breached. And now a big part of that conversation is modeling vaccine strategies. I've never really been in a position where uh, my work was going to have such immediate impact. 
Yeah, there are so many variables that are playing into this data, including taking into account how all of our behavior has been over the last year, which is really hard to quantify at this point. So they're doing their best, like you heard, to kind of account for that and model out. Andrew was saying that over the last year, right, as we've been learning more and more about the virus, the modeling and the data that she's been working on has now become one part of a much larger pool of information that the state is tapping into. And she says she prefers it that way. It was a lot of pr pressure back in March and April. Oh, for sure. So and I know, Nusha, before the vaccine, so much of what was being modeled was what they expected out of our human behavior. And now that people have vaccines in them, their behavior may start changing. You know, some of these 70 plus people may start getting buck wild on us. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm a broken record on this one. But, you know, again, one of the major things that's going to be modeled out is going to be the vaccine impact, but also keeping an eye on the variants. And we've talked to so many people about this, and they're all saying the same thing. The vaccine, the vaccines are such an important step, and it is going to play a role, but really it's going to be our choices about our COVID precautions that are, are going to be critical in the next couple of months. All right. Nusha Roy, thank you for that. She's got you through the weekend on the morning show. Thank you, Nusha. Hey, same day that we told you about state energy regulators looking into whether we're going to pay sky high natural gas prices due to the cold snap, XL Energy dropped an email into our inboxes. Did you see that one? The email warning about a possible price hike for natural gas? I clicked through and read the whole thing because I was like, are they seriously doing this right now because of that? Not related. It's just really awkward timing. Our Marshall Zellinger looks into the rate increase issue. Excel sent customers this email on Wednesday. The subject, important information about natural gas rates. It talks about a pipeline system integrity adjustment rider, basically a fee you already pay to upgrade the natural gas infrastructure. Something not easily understood if you follow the suggestion to visit this link for more information. If you follow the link that is in the notice, it's kind of difficult to pull the pleadings up. You have to look for you know, the case number and then search the DORA records for the filings. Breezy Carlson is an oil and gas attorney and adjunct professor on oil and gas at Western Colorado University in Gunnison. She helped me understand that this email is not about what we told you earlier this week, that Excel spent $650 million on electricity and natural gas this month when natural gas prices skyrocketed. The two are totally unrelated. This particular notice actually relates to a 2002 statute, federal statute, that mandated certain upgrades and infrastructure investment for pipeline safety improvements. Customers started paying this fee in 2012. Excel wants it to continue through 2024. If you knew which link to really click on, you'd see that residential customers currently pay $3.10 per month. Excel is asking state regulators to allow increases over the next three years. Next year, it would be $3.85 per month. That's $9 more for the year. And in 2024, it would be $4.67, so almost $19 more per year than you're paying today. Again, none of that money is related to the $650 million Excel seeks to get paid back for high energy prices this month. To your point about wanting to put or summarize utility-related costs and operations into layman's terms, they absolutely could have done that for their customers and chose not to. These types of riders are common. This one in particular, actually, since it's been extended so many times, there was the previous one, I think, is when Excel thought the work would be done, and now they're asking the PUC for permission to keep adding to the cost for a little bit longer to get the work done. And Kyle, there's going to be a similar one that the state regulators consider for wildfire mitigation. Excel has see, is seeking a wildfire rider to upgrade the technology and, and the infrastructure in forested areas so that we don't have a Paradise California type incident like California had. Absolutely enormous scandal there involving their power company. All right, thank you, Marshall. Tucked into the mountains of Gilpin County is a landmark of black history in Colorado. Lincoln Hills was created in the 1920s, the first resort in the American West to welcome black Americans. Today, there's a nonprofit, Lincoln Hills Cares, that uses that high country camp in order to introduce young people from marginalized communities to the outdoors. Talk to them about science. A thousand kids a year go to Lincoln Hills to get more comfortable in nature. 
and to explore careers that involve the outdoors. Your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign has raised $43,000 to expand Lincoln Care's work. You did all that since Wednesday. If you would like to help, you can text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. I'll send you that link to donate. You have my thanks and the thanks of everybody at Lincoln Hills Cares. This will always be an image I remember from the pandemic. A Coloradan dropping to her knees in emotion as she met her newborn nephew through a screen door. She's back tonight. I can't imagine doing that without her there. As she trades places with her sister. And we celebrate a father's love strengthened on a snow day. Who says you have to feel terrible when you're watching the local news? You don't, because this is next. So I logged on to my classroom. I told my entire class that we should go to the sledding hill and we should protest for no online school on snow days. Like if we don't have snow days, it makes kids sad and kids aren't good at sad. We're starting a new segment here tonight that is part reflection, part transparency. We are going to look back at what was being said about the pandemic one year ago today. It's a chance for us as a community to celebrate how far we've come, to remember who we've lost, what we've lost. And also, it's a way for us to be upfront about what we got right and got wrong when we were talking about the pandemic. This time, last year in 2020, we certainly were hearing a lot of criticism because we were urging Coloradans to take the pandemic seriously before Colorado's politicians did the same. We look back for the first time in our series tonight at February 26, 2020, considering these words now with the perspective of the 12 months that follow, because it's been a year. So you cannot buy one of those surgical face masks, one of those medical face masks, if you tried right now. They're selling out in stores, selling out online. It's the clearest proof yet that Americans are getting worried about coronavirus. Let's focus on the facts of this. CDC says it is a fact that coronavirus will hit the U.S. Their very specific advice today, the CDC, that guys shave their beards so that you can get a good seal with a face mask, that appeared to cause a combination of concern and laughter. If the virus gets traction in Colorado, we could begin to see quarantines. We asked health experts what that means. Most of it would probably involve limiting big public gatherings. So if a fish concert was happening, perhaps that would be asked to be canceled. So a lot of it is what we call social distancing, where you just don't have hundreds of people or thousands of people in mass in close proximity to each other. Isn't it kind of weird to hear us use all those terms like they're foreign concepts like social distancing, masks, coronavirus? That was one year ago tonight, February 26, 2020. Social distancing, of course, did not happen right away. For instance, the fish tour that Dr. Barron mentioned, the fish tour was not canceled until May of 2020. The shows up at the Richard and Commerce City have now been rescheduled for September. tonight, but it is Friday. Temperatures this afternoon warming with lots of sunshine. 41 in Denver, almost 60 in southern Colorado. The next storm already on the move, and that means mountain snow. Denver will be cool and dry for the weekend, and there's a winter weather advisory out for three to six inches of snow from Steamboat down to Aspen and Vale. In Denver, windy west, partly cloudy and a cold low at 16. Tomorrow with sunshine, partly cloudy and 37 by late in the day. Full moon tomorrow night. Warming trend, hello March. Temperatures in the 50s close to 60 by the middle of next week. Charlie Carabetta, the fifth grader who led Denver's Snow Day Revolt, he is now internet famous following his editorial on Next yesterday. Saw all the folks earlier who wrote in with words of thanks for Charlie. We are certainly open to more good ideas on this program, even if they come from adults, but with grown-ups seemingly short of those lately, we make room for another young view tonight. Another 10-year-old, actually. Marcelino, 
who goes by Mars, which is awesome. Mars says that if school districts are going to kill snow days by making them into remote learning days, Mars proposes lag days for when remote learning slows to a crawl online. Mars, the floor is yours. You want to take snow days away from us? You want us to stay inside and just sit on a monitor? Well, let me tell you this. That's bad for your eyes. One, that's bad for your eyes, yeah. And if you're going to take away your snow days, lag day. If our computer crashes three times in a row, well, not in a row, but three times, we get the day off. You can't say anything about that. Because if you take snow days away from us, we're doing lag day. She, the whole time, was like, I'm there, I'll be there, I'm going to be with you. It's a role reversal for these sisters we met in April. Their bond moved us. It still does. It's a Friday Good News Update. Next. What's your good news? Every Friday we ask somebody, sometimes strangers, sometimes people we've met, like the woman we met last April when she met her newborn nephew through a screen door, an emotional moment that brought her to her knees. She's back this week for the 238th edition of your Friday Good News because she has an update for our Tom Cole. Having a baby at the start of the pandemic, oh, I just wouldn't wish that upon anyone. For sisters Kelly Capazzoli. I miss my sister. And Jess Shoup. She's yeah. big sister, savior. <laughs> having a baby during the pandemic came with some extra heartache. It was just beginning for all the COVID restrictions. It's so awesome having him. When Kelly had her baby, the closest Jess could get, her sister's front porch for a little wave and a moment to take in as much of the view as possible. Oh, I fast forward a bit. And I went into labor on February 10th. And now it's and Jess's turn to deliver her. during the pandemic. The and like always, these two wanted to be there for each other. They had to be because Jess's husband couldn't. That was tough. In January, Marine training pulled her husband away from seeing the birth of their baby. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I had no idea if he was going to be able to be there or even see anything. For Jess, it was an uncertain time and a stressful time. For Kelly, it was time to be and the big sister. I, just, I had to be there. You know, she did a lot for me after um, I had him. Kelly stepped into action. I was texting his captain saying, uh, we're, you know, we're having a baby today. Little baby Aspen was born February 10th. And with a little help from FaceTime, dad was there too. My good news is I have a super healthy baby. I'll be able to see my husband soon. My good news is everyone I love is happy and healthy. In one month, my new niece is going to meet her dad. I'm really happy about that. For next, I'm Tom Cole. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a powder day in Denver creating the conditions for backyard ski school. Nice turn. I went fast. You went fast. Daddy, you want to ski? Let's ski here. Thank you. You're welcome. I love you. I love you. Hmm. Oh, that is the best. That is the good stuff right there. Grateful that Stephen shared that moment with his son Oliver and love that they had a little audience there hanging out watching from the sidewalk. Jim Martin writes in about our young commentator tonight. Mars is a baller. That's my good news, Jim says. Agreed.